Okay, good. Another minute. You can go back to talking. Give us another minute. And then Happy New Year. Good start of the new year, right? Yeah. We're here to recognize the best of the best for the fourth uh, quarter, I'm sorry, third quarter of last year. And uh, to start us off, I always like God in the house. And we have our chaplain here who uh, is going to start us off with a prayer. Chap. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for today. You said this is the day that you've made, and we're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Now, this is always a special time uh, in our sheriff's office where we stop and reflect about some of the uh, awesome people that uh, you've allowed to work here in this agency as we serve our community. We thank you for a new year and a fresh opportunity to see your amazing grace uh, continue to work through the lives of the men and women we call the sheriff's office home, and we thank you for uh, not only our officers and our civilian staff, but also some of the special people in our community that we're recognizing today as well, because we're always better together. And now, Lord, we pray uh, your continued hand of blessing and protection rest upon uh, all of our law enforcement officers uh, that certainly go beyond the scope of the sheriff's office, but particularly for our men and women, but also all the law officers up and down this Treasure Coast, Gold Coast, and Space Coast that uh, serve and protect. Watch over them as they keep our communities safe. And again, we thank you for the amazing privilege and opportunity you give all of us to, uh, at times, to be your hands extended. We pray this prayer in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chaplain. The Chaplain said it best. We are better together. Uh, and we can't do our job without our community supporting us, assisting us helping us along the way. And I'm here to recognize three in the community that have done just that. Uh, the first one, Raul. Is Raul here? Did he make it? I don't think he made it. Okay. Patty Hamilton, come on up. Patty is going to receive the Distinguished Service Award. And on July 25th, 2016, Patty, wife to one of our Savannah COP volunteers, witnessed an event that simply compelled her to take action. While leaving her community, uh, the Savannah Club, she observed a stopped vehicle in the oncoming lane with the passenger door open. As she approached, she, sh she saw the legs dangling from the door, and the driver was delivering blows to an unseen front passenger. Patty immediately called 911, a reaction prompted the driver to push the passenger out of the car and speed away. The woman passenger fled on foot, and Mrs. Hamilton, right here next to us, opted to follow the driver. <laughs> <laughs> While she was following, she was relaying additional information to 911. 
Losing sight of the suspect on more than one occasion, she was able to catch sight of his vehicle just as he found the exit to the development. Mrs. Hamilton was able to stop with the deputies who conducted a traffic stop at the nearby convenience store. Much to her surprise, the victim had at some point gotten back into the car of her abuser. Deputies made a domestic violence arrest based upon statements taken and observed injuries to the victim. The suspect was already on probation for a separate domestic violence arrest. Thanks to her quick, willing, and prudent actions, the delicate partnership between us and our community was successful in addressing this act of violence. And uh, we thank you for your actions. And uh, when I came to the Savannah Club, what was that, about a couple of months ago? I surprised her by recognizing her there, but I wanted to formally do it here too. So come on over here. And I'm going to give you this one right here. Those of you who receive uh, recognition in front, you don't have to stay for the whole ceremony, only if you want. Uh, the next is a Distinguished Service Award for Annette Brown, who's here with us. And before I tell you what her award is for, uh, you know how I like to read letters uh, at the end of our award ceremony. And I want to say it's been two years ago? Has it been that long? Two years? Boy, time flies. Two years ago, I remember receiving a letter uh, that was so heartfelt, uh, so emotional, uh, that immediately when I received it, I called the records. I said, you gotta, you got to tell me about this case. And uh, what it boiled down to is uh, Annette was stopped by Deputy Snow. She was given three citations, but Deputy Snow gave a little bit more than three citations. He gave uh, a tremendous amount of wisdom and a tremendous amount of uh, support and empowerment and uh, I believe the tickets were eventually dropped is that correct and she went on to tell me in this letter that that traffic stop did more in her life than many many other events had and it truly was a heartfelt letter and I still remember it to this day I mean it was it was really amazing letter and now we're here to recognize her for an its distinguished service award and to tell you, we need more residents like Annette because, like I said, this is a partnership, and together we are better. But Annette is the director of programs uh, for the Morning After Center for Hope and Healing and uh, was thrilled that the staff from several St. Lucie County departments uh, spent time making improvements at the Sheridan Plaza Rec Center located off Juanita Avenue. She's also uh, a member of the Sheridan Park Homeowners Association. Crews from the county removed invasive trees and shrubs, added 50 truckloads of fill and dirt to grade the playground in Sheridan Park, installed fencing, painted restrooms and the pavilions, resurfaced and lined the basketball court as well. However, Mrs. Brown, her spirits were dampened when after seeing all this work, vandals came by a couple days later and spray painted graffiti on the picnic tables and the pavilions. Mrs. Brown gathered some members of the Sheridan Park Homeowners Association. They drove to the store, they purchased new paint, and began cleaning all the graffiti up and repainted the entire area. They also picked up 1,500 pounds of trash from the park. Mrs. Brown stated to the press, this is my community and I love my community. We aren't gonna let some thugs run it. We have the same motto here, so we're on the same page. <laughs> We need more people like Mrs. Brown in our community to keep our community safe and clean. Thank you for taking the action you did, and thank you, thank you for being such a great partner. We love you. Thank you.
we have many groups in our community that help us tremendously. One that I just want to talk about for a few seconds is uh, the Guardians of River Park. Uh, and they're all seated here on this second table, and many of you have uh, maybe witnessed them in the River Park community wearing their T-shirts, and they're out there uh, checking the marina and River Park area looking for thugs and anything out of the ordinary, and they call us. And uh, we've had a great partnership for uh, many years, and I can honestly say because of their involvement, the River Park area is better. And today, uh, we're honored to have uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lindsay, better known as Maritha and Bill, to present uh, a couple of t-shirts. One to me, one to Dorothy. I don't know where the other ones are going. You know, last year, I think you gave me a 3X, but this year, it better be an XL, OK? Yeah. <laughs> I know the TV makes me look fatter. <laughs> Come on up. Maritha and Bill Lindsay from Guardians of River Park. You want to say a few words, too? Yes, I just do. want to tell them about this organization. Okay, do it. Okay. We love it. Good morning. You're limited to 30 minutes, okay, uh, okay. just because. All right, okay. that's good. Okay. okay. First of all, we want to thank the St. Lucie County Sheriff's Office for giving us the opportunity to be a part of your ceremony today. And I am Aretha Lindsay, the treasurer for Guardians of River Park, my husband, Bill Lindsay, the director. And the Guardians of River Park is a nonprofit organization chartered in 2009. Our purpose is to be the eyes and ears of the community and for law enforcement, to keep River Park Marina a desirable place in which to picnic, play, fish, and boat, to assist others in need, including but not limited to lawn and home maintenance in our community. The membership meetings are held the first Saturday of each month at 4 o'clock at the River Park Marina. And we are fortunate to have Russ Cullum to attend our meetings to keep us abreast to what's happening in our neighborhood and our community. And also, Sergeant Z and Sergeant Sigmund also attend our meetings when they're available. So with a small token of appreciation, we want to present to Sheriff Mascara one of our Guardian shirts and a decal for his car, but he's already received his cap, so you don't get another cap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and also, a special thanks to Miss Dorothy, who is always there to support our cause when needed. And again, we want to say thank you so very much for all of your support from the Guardians of River Park. Thank you. We appreciate you very much. Thank you, Bill. Nice seeing you. Happy New Year. She's standing right there. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. You know, imagine if we just had 1,000 organizations like this in our community. Wow, that'd be awesome. Next, uh, the Department of Administration is going to recognize their heroes. And uh, up is Major Rothman. Major? Behind the film <laughs> camera? I just want to ask one more time, has Raul uh, arrived? Raul? No, I don't think he's coming. In. Okay, thanks. There you go. That's your picture. Yeah. Good morning. I'm here to recognize uh, James Abel, uh, Captain Charlie Scavuzzo, Sergeant James Wills, uh, Stephanie Cole, Kay Long, and Kate McCormick from the school district. If you can all come up. <laughs> I got you other interviews, didn't I? I'm going to make it quick. Uh, on uh, September 13, 2016, Deputy James Abel was contacted by Ms. Kate McCormick, a school counselor at Dale Cassidy's. Kate identified a 14-year-old student who was absent from school for a few weeks. Deputy Abel went to the home to learn the reason why the child was not attending school. The child was caring for an 84-year-old uh, grandmother. The child's father was incarcerated, and the child stepped in to, to provide needs for the grandmother. Deputy Abel also learned there were barely any food in the residence, and they had no means of obtaining food at this time. <laughs> Deputy Abel spoke to his, with Ms. McCormick, who put him in touch with image of, image of Chris Church. Image of Christ Church, I apologize. That's okay. 
Uh, the church immediately provided a few hot meals for the child and the grandmother. The de uh, Deputy Abel drove these meals to the residence. Deputy Abel was also contacted his immediate supervisor, James, James, Jamie Wills. Uh, Sergeant Wills reached out to Stephanie Cole, a victim's advocate at the time, and Kay Long. They immediately provided food items through Grace Emanuel Church. Sergeant Wills drove those items to the residence for for a more than a long-term solution, Captain Charlie Scavuzzo contacted the Treasure Coast Food Bank, who graciously donated a month's worth of food and additional items, excuse me, essential items. The next day, uh, Captain Scavuzzo delivered these items to the residents. A few weeks, or, or a week or so went by, Sergeant Willis provided a, a bicycle to the child, who also had, uh, the bicycle had been stolen. Uh, arrangements were also made to to better facilitate the social security money to be delivered to the grandmother so that they could be provided food items. As a result, the child went back to school and the family needs were sustained. So congratulations. Next up is uh, Major Patai. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Wow, it's a crowded room. Yes. Standing room only. Standing room only. You're going to swear them all in? Uh, no, I'm about worn out. Okay. First, I'd like to introduce our detention deputy of the third quarter, Deputy Danetta Johnson. Yeah! <laughs> deputy Johnson was nominated by her peers as detention deputy of the quarter. This is what her fellow officers had to say about Deputy Johnson. Deputy Johnson has stepped up to the role as acting supervisor of the Bravo Wing. The B Wing is a mixture of general population, mental health, juveniles, medical, and federal inmates. Due to the diverse group of inmates, this wing experiences a higher risk of violence and bad behavior because of the presence of mental illness. Deputy Johnson has excelled as an acting supervisor because of her knowledge and experience. Her performance outshines and is on par with most veteran detention sergeants. Her recent role as acting supervisor ran from July 2016 until September 2016. In addition to serving as a supervisor, Deputy Johnson continued as a field training officer and excelling in training our new detention deputies. Deputy Johnson is the epitome of a well-rounded, knowledgeable deputy that we all one day want to be. Congratulations. <laughs> Detention supervisor of the third quarter, Lieutenant Jeff Jackson. The Department of Detention would like to recognize Lieutenant Jeff Jackson as a supervisor of the third quarter. In the beginning of 2016, former Sergeant Jeff Jackson was reassigned to the administrative unit. His main duties and responsibilities were overseeing the jail lobby, law library, sex offender registration, and the inmate indigent program. This unit had many staffing issues. Staff were on extended leave. We had resignations, retirements, promotions and other factors that affected the staffing. Sergeant Johnson was able to reduce overtime by developing a new schedule which prevented, which benefited staff assigned as well as reduce overtime. While handling these staffing issues, he also worked various other projects, little projects like accreditation and other safety issues of the facility. Thank you, Lieutenant Jackson. And last, I have a commendation for Deputy Scott Kaler, Deputy Stephen Paceres, and Deputy Kendrick Thomas. On September 9th, 2016, Deputy Scott Kaler, Stephen Paceres, and Kendrick Thomas were working Housing Unit Delta 2 East, which are restricted custody maximum security prisoners. Approximately 180 inmates are housed in five dormitories with violent charges either current or past. Dorm 10 was having ongoing injury issues of the inmates. 
Deputy Thomas was working the floor when he noticed one of the inmates did not come out for lunch or dinner. Deputy Thomas checked on the inmate and saw he had bruises on his face. Deputy Thomas removed the inmate from the dorm. When questioned, the inmate did not want to reveal what happened or divulge information regarding the continuous injuries to inmates that were occurring in the dorm. The entire dorm was locked down until a thorough investigation could be con conducted. Deputy Scott Kaler remembered another inmate who was recently removed from the dorm and interviewed him. In addition, Deputy Thomas and Stephen Paceres talked with several other inmates who were removed from the dorm previously. Deputy Kaler stayed after his assigned shift and completed um, interviews of additional inmates, gathered more information, and generated an incident report. The investigative results and findings showed six inmates were involved. These inmates were permanently removed from the dorm, given discipl disciplinary reports, and transferred to disciplinary confinement. These inmates were involved in a fight club. The fight club was called, quote unquote, test of heart. This test of heart club involved any new inmate coming into the dorm, giving a choice of three individuals in the dorm to fight. And they had to fight three times. If they did not fight, they would have to surrender their canteen or anything else the inmates who were running the club decided. Deputies Kayla, Paceres, and Thomas investigation revealed what was going on in the dorm and removed the threat and future harm of other inmates. Thank you for a job well done. I'd like to introduce Captain Doug Hardy next. He's going to cover the Department of Law Enforcement. Good morning. I'm here to uh, recognize the Department of Law Enforcement's uh, first recipient is Detective James Jennings. Jay Jennings. I, I just want you to look at this young man. Does he look like a million dollars? Look at this guy. <laughs> you like it. You do. Now, when this goes on Facebook, the first comment is, who is standing next to JJ in the picture? <laughs> uh, Detective James Jennings has, uh, began the uh, Sheriff's Office in September of 2003. During the third quarter, Detective Jennings was assigned 45 cases and pulled 11 additional cases for a total of 56. One highlight from the quarter, Detective Jennings was investigating a theft from a local retirement community. He found a link between several victims. They all had the same cleaning service. Detective Jennings was able to locate several pieces of stolen property from various pawn shops. These items were pawned by one of the employees from the cleaning service. After he interviewed the suspect, she admitted to the thefts and where each of the property belonged. This resulted in Detective Jennings pulling several new case numbers for people who did not know they were victimized from these crimes. Several of the senior citizens who were victimized received their property back and the suspect was arrested. In addition, Detective Jennings assisted in the following cases. Detective Jennings was able to obtain a confession from a suspect in the mosque battery. He also assisted with follow-up interviews in the neighborhood canvas from the mosque arson, also the 42nd San Diego homicide. These are just a few examples of the many investigations Detective Jennings was involved with from this quarter. Detective Jennings has a positive influence on his peers and the public. Thank you and keep up the good work. <laughs> Supervisor of the quarter, Adam Goodner, Rob Pettit. On the evening of September 11th, an individual intentionally set fire to the Islamic Center in Fort Pierce. Due to a perfect storm of individuals on previously approved leave, Sergeant Pettit was the lone supervisor in CID. Sergeant Pettit was called to the scene and arrived shortly after midnight on September 12th and instantly assumed an overwhelming leadership role in directing the immediate investigation process into the events of that evening. This included working directly with our agency's arson investigator, crime scene technicians, patrol supervisors, and St. Lucie County Fire District personnel. As the morning broke, 
it became apparent that additional support would be needed to effectively conduct this now global news event. I was in Colorado watching it, by the way. Um, Lieutenant Goodner was called to coordinate and implement the multi-agency command. He was put to work quickly, and both he and Sergeant Pettit divided the investigative responsibilities to ensure a thorough job. Lieutenant Goodner coordinated the canvassing of all tips, while Sergeant Pettit maintained oversight of the active crime scene and on-site investigation. This level of teamwork and whatever it takes attitude resulted in the identification and arrest of the suspect after only 60 hours of initial incident. The leadership of these two supervisors did not stop with the mosque arson. On September 19th, patrol units attempted to serve a Baker Act on an individual in Port St. Lucie. The individual barricaded himself inside the home and a standoff resulted. Lieutenant Goodner led the crisis negotiation team efforts and communicated with the subject, again attempting to gain his surrender. Meanwhile, Sergeant Pettit led the on-scene perimeter, the SWAT team's efforts to surround the house, and attempt to secure the subject. Due to the aggressive actions of the subject, the SWAT team was required to use deadly force, and the subject died from his injuries. But wait, there's more. Two days later, on September 22nd, another barricaded subject incident occurred where Lieutenant Goodard and Sergeant Pettit were again called upon as the lead aspects of the response. This this incident ended safely with the person being taken into custody due to a large involvement of both Goodner and Pettit. As you can see, in a short span of 11 days, the leadership role of these two supervisors were put to the test and they performed well. Throughout each of these, each decision they made took into consideration the impact on the agency, the community, and the parties involved, and the legal and ethical obligation. Thank you. The next we have is Volunteer of the Quarter, Clive Niles. <laughs> Mr. Clive Niles has been volunteering with the Sheriff's Office Traffic Unit since 2004. Mr. Niles is a parking enforcement specialist who has volunteered over 339 hours to our office. He's issued numerous parking violations throughout the county. Mr. Niles serves as a liaison to other park and enforcement volunteers. In addition, he assists with our courier needs for the traffic unit. In addition to being a park and enforcement specialist, he serves as a special deputy. Mr. Niles is assigned to work a polling precinct during all elections. The average day at a polling precinct is a minimum of 12 hours. Furthermore, Mr. Niles donates his time to the Port St. Lucie Police Department's Crime Scene Unit and Criminal Investigation Division. He's volunteered with them for the last 15 years. Mr. Niles is a very dedicated, valuable member of the traffic unit and the law enforcement. Thank you for all you do.
The next we have is Life Saving, Lieutenant Steve Sigmund. On September 24, 2016, Lieutenant Steve Sigmund was attending the Day of Remembrance event on behalf of the Sheriff's Office. This event was attended by approximately 30 community members from the chapter of Parents of Murdered Children. During the ceremony, Lieutenant Sigmund witnessed a young child coughing and choking. The child didn't gasp for air. It was evident the child had a constricted airway and was choking. Lieutenant Sigmund immediately took charge of the situation administered abdominal thrust and back blows and dislodged the piece of hard candy that the mother had previously given the child. Thanks to Lieutenant Sigmund's quick, decisive action, the child's life was saved. Thank you. I just want to share something about that event. I was actually invited to attend that event, but that day I had like four four events on my calendar. I know the chief had four events, and we tasked Lieutenant Sigmund to go on my behalf. Um, I think it was within minutes of this event happening. My phone just went crazy. Uh, and of course, immediately you think it's something bad that's happened in the office. But out of the 30 people that were at that meeting, I think 10 of them had my cell phone number. <laughs> and they immediately called and texted me and said, you will not believe the miracle that just happened here. He said, one of your young, good-looking deputies, and I never thought it was him. <laughs> young, good, I'll, never, I'll never forget the test. One of your young, good-looking deputies just saved a little boy at this meeting. So, Lieutenant Sigmund, thank you. Uh, that was a heck of a, uh, heck of a service. And uh, honestly, I probably couldn't have done it if I was at that meeting. So God has a weird way of working. So thanks for being there. Next is a life-saving award for Jose Angulo and Samantha Wheeler. On October 2nd, 2016, Deputy Samantha Wheeler and Jose Angulo responded to an overdose call. When they arrived, they saw an unconscious woman lying on the kitchen floor. She was not breathing and her face turned blue to do the lack of oxygen. After Deputy Angulo determined the female had no pulse, he started compress chest compressions while Deputy Wheeler prepared the administer of the Noxalone, which is Narcan. The Noxalone was given while chest compressions were still in progress and several seconds later, the woman regained consciousness and was put in a recovery position until rescue arrived. The female admitted snorting 30 milligrams of oxycodone and drinking an unknown amount of beer. If it wasn't for their quick actions, the female may not have succumbed to the effects of the drugs and alcohol. Thank you for a job well done. Life saving, Justin Jackson. On July 14, 2016, Deputy Justin Jackson responded to a suicide call. An out-of-state family member called with information that her brother, James Rogers, had taken over 100 Tylenol pills and intended to jump off a bridge. Deputy Jackson checked the last known address for Rogers but was unsuccessful. Deputy Jackson began searching the county for Rogers while continuously calling Rogers' cell phone. At one point, Rogers stated he was at the North Bridge. However, when Deputy Jackson arrived at the location, Rogers was not there. Deputy Jackson then went to the South Bridge where he found Rogers. Deputy Jackson placed his, placed his body between the railings and Rogers several times while speaking with him to prevent him from jumping off the bridge. Deputy Jackson persuaded Rogers away from the bridge. He was then taken into custody and transported to New Horizons. Thanks to Deputy Jackson's persistence and patience, a life was saved. Thank you. Uh, this is a life saving for Brian Rhodes, Ryan Register, Melvin Goyachea, Justin Jackson, Mitchell Mazanowski, David Meisinger, and William Miller. On 
September 7th, 2016, a lookout via dispatch was put out for a red Cadillac SUV with a female driving who was armed and threatening suicide. This originated from a call for service where Fort Pierce police responded for a despondent woman who had been seen by several witnesses threatening suicide and placing a handgun in her mouth and driving away from the location. Detective Register spotted the vehicle and he was in an unmarked and he followed and observed until Deputy Jackson arrived. The driver was headed towards Indian River County. Deputy Jackson attempted to stop the vehicle However, the driver refused to stop. A short time later, Deputy Mitchell Mazanowski deployed stingers, flattening three of her tires. The driver continued for a short time, stopping at a residence in Indian River County. Her residence was surrounded by Sergeant Rhodes, Deputy Meisinger, Bill Miller, Melvin Goyachea. A few minutes later, Indian River Sheriff's Office arrived. As Indian River deputies took the woman into custody, she ingested a large handful of pills. Moments after she was handcuffed, she collapsed. She was not breathing and had no pulse. Indian River deputies began CPR while deputies Mazanowski administered Narcan to the female. AMS arrived and took over life-saving measures. Indian River Hospital later advised that the woman was in critical condition but stable. Medical staff said if it were not for the administration of the Narcan by Deputy Mazanowski, along with the CPR, the victim may have died. Thank you. Next, we'll go to a unit citation to the start.
deputy who is in the field training officer must know when it all comes, excuse me, a deputy who's in the field training officer must know when it all, when it comes to being a member of this program. FTOs are volunteers who have had advanced training, are in good standing with the agency, and are excelling with the desire to share their knowledge and skills with others and deputies coming into the field. The deputies assigned to the FTO program have dedicated over 21,000 hours of training and instruction to over 30 new employees this year. This does not include refresher training for reassigned patrol operations deputies and or new supervisor training. Thank you for all the hard work and dedication. Sure. Next, our legal counsel, Adam Fetterman, will recognize the civilian of the quarter. Good morning. I'm the general. Oh boy, here we go. <laughs> um, I'm very proud to be up here this morning, but I, I have to say I'm a little disappointed. I used to think I was the best dressed in the agency, oh, and then no. Jennings shows up looking oh, like this today. Man, I... and. And on top of that, I thought I had the best hair, and then Stubbly and, and Snyder, wherever, wherever they are. I, I think I'm just going to give up and wear a burlap sack on Monday. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, acknowledge and honor Andre Brindley this morning, uh, risk management specialist. I have a few remarks I'd like to share about Andre after reading the nomination. Andre is nominated by Don Cryack. Uh, our inspector in the general counsel's office. And Don's memo stated, at the beginning of the quarter, I was tasked with the responsibilities of insurance policy management for the agency. The deadline for contract changes and rewrites to policies was fast approaching, and I knew that much of my training would be on the fly. I was also dealing with the personal weight of my mother's declining health, hospice care, and eventual passing in our home. Andrea sensed the potential for an overwhelming workload, and without hesitation or question, stepped in and insisted upon taking over the insurance work, something she was familiar with in the past. In her daily routine, Andrea works tirelessly on the ever-increasing workers' comp claims. Notice ever-increasing. We need those to go down, please. Be careful. Coordinating medical visits and ensuring the lengthy documentation is filed with our state, our payroll, and our insurance company. She assists in public records redactions and coordinates the yearly driver safety awards. As her coworker, I knew Andrea was a valuable source of knowledge and policy guidelines. Now Andrea, as a friend, offered to shoulder another role in addition to her uh, above normal workload. In the course of tackling the insurance policy management, Andrea's audit of our policies found numerous opportunities for significant cost savings, greater efficiencies, and increases in coverage without accompanying increases in cost. To date, the overall monetary savings to the Sheriff's Office has not yet been calculated, but it has been significant. Andrea's above and beyond style achieved more than what one could be asked to do. And in this quarter, Andrea was not asked to accept this assignment, but rather offered to do it. And I will tell you that in a little over a year of Andrea coming to join the general counsel's office and our team, uh, small but mighty, um, in a restructuring of the risk management responsibilities, it has been a joy to have her. Uh, she is right where she belongs. She's got 18 years of incredible knowledge and experience in this agency. And she shows up here no matter what with a smile on her face every single day. And I am grateful for you, and thank you for all that you do for us. And she is going to be especially rewarded in heaven to having to work with him and Don, <laughs> because I only get to work with him a little bit. And, <laughs> and the general, right. <laughs> Listen, I think the theme here is the theme that we always go by, and that's protect and serve. And we are better together. And uh, we do great things in the community. You know, I tell this story all the time, especially new deputies. Make an arrest, writing speeding tickets, chasing down a bad guy. That's nothing. Those are easy. Man, we could do those all day long. But when we do special things in our community that really, really impact lives, that's special. That's, that's good stuff. Every quarter, I bring my notes. These are the letters I've received in the third quarter, and they each have a story. And the story usually is of one in which a deputy has entered the life of someone, such as this young lady here, and has made a profound change in a life. I'm going to read uh, two of the letters, three of the letters, 
And I'm going to start off this first one, which uh, I really chuckled when, uh, when I received it. Uh, it starts off, Dear Sheriff Kenny, <laughs> on Tuesday, I had a flat tire on Walton Road. Two of your officers stopped and really meant the world to me. They were there for my safety and to remove all worry from me. I appreciate both of their assistance. They stood with me, changed my tire, made sure I was safe and on my way, and made sure I made it home. Uh, enclosed in this card is their, their card, which they gave to them, and I hope that you and all of your deputies have a great 2017. Thank you again. Signed, Sheila Turnin, and the deputies involved were Deputy uh, Rocola and Deputy Witt. So great job, guys. <laughs> Next one is more serious note. I received this uh, recently. I would like to commend one of your deputy sheriffs on his visit to my home on the morning of November 25th. That would have been a couple days before Thanksgiving. His name is Deputy Sean Freeman. He came to my home on the above-mentioned morning to inform me of my son's death. My son lived in Plantation, Florida, and he died at the Westside Regional Hospital. He died after calling 911 and hanging up from his residence, and the Plantation Fire Department had to forcibly break into his home. When Deputy Freeman came to my home, my wife answered the door. It was approximately 4.30 in the morning. At first, we told him we didn't call 911, and he asked if we had a son by the name of Kevin. My wife immediately came to the bedroom and woke me up, and I was stunned seeing a sheriff's deputy in my front door. He was invited into the house, and he told me the entire story of what happened with our son, Kevin. He was most considerate and wanted to know if there was anything or anyone he would like us to call. He was concerned, and he stayed with us while I called my other daughters and my other son. As a retired New York City police officer myself, I know from experience what a difficult job it is to notify a family member of a loved one's death. On behalf of our family, I want to take this opportunity to thank your deputy for his concern and his sympathy and caring to us. Thank you and God bless every one of your men and women who serve under you. Signed, John and Eileen McCary on behalf of the family. A great, great letter. <clears throat> Another one. Good afternoon. This was uh, sent via email. Good afternoon. I want to take this opportunity to recognize three outstanding deputies that were really outstanding last night. Last night being November 22nd, 2016. I came home to find a strange man sitting at the bottom of my stairwell who started harassing me and my dog. The first deputy to arrive, I believe, was Deputy Snow, then Deputy Seraphim, and last but not least was Deputy Masters and his canine. I want to thank each and every one of them for being so kind and nice to me, my neighbors and my dog. They engaged me, calmed me down, talked to me, really made me feel safe and easier after such an upsetting, scary moment for me. In a world of such negativity, I would like to shine some positivity and let you know that I, as a citizen in need, appreciated their immediate response and the kindness of their service. I am glad that I am in sheriff territory rather than PSL. <laughs> she said it, not me. I mean, <laughs> I seem to have so much more friendly encounters uh, at random with deputies on a day-to-day -day passing on the road or in the store or just passing by. I just wanted to stop and give thanks, appreciation where it is due, and some kind, friendly, helpful deputies who I want to continue to bless and thank. Signed, Bridget McGuire. It's a pretty good letter, right? <laughs> Protect and serve, that's what we do. Each and every day, you guys and girls do amazing things, on duty, off duty. Uh, we appreciate you, the community appreciates you. This concludes our uh, award ceremony. We have uh, cookies and drinks right outside. Thank you all for coming, and congratulations to all the honorees.